so that was a lot of answers lot of answers um okay so next up in line we have dr gustavo zubieta kaleja uh he's the director high altitude pulmonary and pathology institute ippa um uh, actually for his introduction i'm just going to read his message in the chat box it was a very intriguing message and that describes his personality i am giving my talk from la paz bolivia it is 8 am here and i live at 3500 meters above sea level evolution at high altitude and beyond in space so um gustavo sir over to you good morning thank you very much ritika i am truly fascinated to be present in this such a fascinating uh, conference and i definitely want to uh, thank all the organizers and all the people that have been so kind and invited me to participate you see i am uh, going to give a completely different talk uh, uh, so i cannot attend most conferences because i am in the middle of the night but um i hope you enjoy what i'm about to share with you because this is the product of 50 years of work at high altitude and um, i'm going to show you uh, some very very interesting um different points of view and how i we are focusing many things about hypoxia low oxygen levels and uh so my talk now starts with this name adaptation genetic adaptation physiological adaptation intelligence and biospace forming i hope everything is uh, you are catching my screen and you're listening to what i'm saying we can we can see your screen uh We, oh, 50th anniversary of what, sir? I'm I'm very sorry. 50th anniversary of what? Oh, the 50th anniversary of our institution, the High Altitude Pulmonary and Pathology Institute here in Bolivia at 3,500 meters above sea level. We we work with uh, high altitude adaptation and we uh, treat patients with high altitude diseases, but we also do a lot of research and we've done a lot of COVID. uh research congratulations sir i'm sure it's thank a you big, so big much so uh let me tell you that we we have we are based on on uh on principles called science honor and truth and we award this in in a conference we organize every two years which i'll be talking to you a little bit about um so you see this man absolutely was brilliant that's why we are all gathering in this meeting what a brilliant man look at his face look at his stare and let me show you what happened with time to him he turned to look like this now it impacts me he has a very special stare and if you look at for of at that age you will see that same stare I see sadness in Charles Darwin's eyes and I can understand it because he proposed something a theory that was totally revolutionary but truly made him sick because of all the attacks that he suffered he was constantly under attack because when people come up with new ideas they are attacked because people want to maintain the old ideas so he suffered and I'm sorry for what he suffered but i can understand him but i honor him greatly because he is totally fantastic and but of course he evolved in time as you can see he evolved in time and this is adaptation within his lifetime so this adaptation is a physiological adaptation in time and is aging this is very important to what i'm going to talk so he said and you by the way you have a beautiful logo a beautiful picture of 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 the conference i'm 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 really delighted to participate it is not the strongest of the species that survive nor the most intelligent 
but one, but the one most responsive to change. Absolutely right, the most responsive to change. And so you see, there are some types of adaptation that you have to see that we utilize here. Somehow this got all joined together, but it has to be with has to do with genetic adaptation and physiological adaptation. Genetic adaptation brings forth, it comes as a consequence of Darwin's evolution by millions of years in change in the genes that you are talking beautifully, genetic change. But Uh, Hello. Yes. yes, we can hear you now. I was muted somehow. Okay. So, oh, yes. um, so what I what I was telling you is that we also you have on one hand genetic adaptation and you have on another hand physiological adaptation, which is during the lifetime survival, like aging, like I showed you what happened to Charles Darwin. It takes days to months, and it has epigenetic changes, like the hypoxia inducible factor when during the exposure to low oxygen levels where there's hypoxia. But physiological adaptation does play a role in genetic adaptation, and I'll show you that. You see, the hematocrit is the, if we take some blood from somebody's living at sea level and we centrifuge, and we centrifuge the, the blood, you will see that you can separate the red blood cells here uh, from the plasma and it's around 36 or 40% at sea level. This is the normal hematocrit, the relation between red blood cells and plasma. And anemia, of course, would be much lower, less red blood cells. But, and these red blood cells are the porters of oxygen. What happens when you come to high altitude? Take a look at that again. The, the hematocrit rises to 50%. This is my normal hematocrit here in La Paz, 50%. Look at that, isn't that amazing? But some people at high altitude present what's called chronic mountain sickness, which we call polyerythrocytemia, and they have many red blood cells. And you know, they have above 58% here in La Paz, Bolivia, for instance, but, but you know, this has been turned loss of adaptation. And I don't think there's a forum where I could really express what this, problem is all about in science. You see, this term has been used by hundreds, if not thousands of papers and continue to be used, referring to chronic mountain sickness, a disease where there's more red blood cells than the normal high altitude residents. Now, why do they have more red blood cells? Because they have lung disease, because they have heart disease, and they have other kinds of diseases that don't allow enough oxygen molecules to go to their organism to go through th their tissues. So they increase red blood cells. But somehow, from the beginning, chronic mountain sickness was said to be loss of adaptation. And this is frankly horrible because you cannot lose adaptation. Adaptation is always a positive progress. We're definitely interested in the genetic recording machine mentioned by Dr. George George in relation to hypoxia, and I'll explain why. Hundreds, if not thousands of papers have used this erroneous terminology, loss of adaptation, and even continue to do so. It's, it's a huge mistake in science. So let me show you what happened. I was a visiting professor. Uh, I live at high altitude, as you all know, at 3,500 meters. And I went to study uh, and, and work as a visiting professor at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. After three months, I came back to La Paz and my hematocrit had gone down to 36%. So it took 40 days for me to achieve my normal hematocrit, which is 50% at high altitude. And so this is called what we call intermediate adaptation. And you get to a point where you have full adaptation to high altitude, physiological adaptation, of course. In the beginning, you can have some diseases coming to high altitude acutely, but then and intermediate diseases, but then you just have a normal adaptation life at high altitude. But some people present what we were talking about, chronic mountain sickness, and they increase their red cells much more. But you see, all these things are simply physiological adaptation. Now, 
you see aging goes from being a little baby and standing up and going through time in this direction, physiological adaptation, but it can never go in the reverse direction. No way, you, unless you guys change telomeres and make us younger, maybe you will. So you see again, Darwin, he cannot, we cannot speak of loss of aging. How could he become a young man? This is why loss of adaptation is a horrible mistake in science as being treated at high altitude medicine. And that's why my father, who passed away five years ago, and he's the founder of an institution, said, wrote a book, and he said, forever, loss of adaptation does not exist. So now let me show you the formula that we created that's called high altitude adaptation formula. It says adaptation equals time over altitude. And it's interesting, physiologically, this is, for instance, for La Paz, when you come up to 3,500 meters, you need 40 days to adapt. But in genetic adaptation, for limbs to appear or disappear, it takes billion, millions of years. And this formula adapts also, it works for adaptation in genetics. How does coronavirus affect the lung? Now, let me show you a little bit of this. I created a new terminology called pneumolysis instead of pneumonia in COVID, because pneumolysis means lung destruction, extreme viral aggression, destruction of the alveolar capillary tissue. So this RNA molecule with this capsule, surrounded by this capsule, comes in and destroys our lungs. This is why people die. This is pneumolysis. It's an acute, acute infectious disease marked by inoculation of the RNA, coronavirus RNA within the pneumocytes, which are the lung cells, intracellular reproduction and the destruction of these cells, generally not compromising the, the, the tubes, the respiratory tubes called bronchioles, and it's accompanied by inflammation, edema, and so on. These are all medical terms, but the concept is very important because look what happens to the lungs of these patients. You see the lungs should be black like this, but you see all those white spots? That's where the virus is hitting the lungs and destroying the lungs. And that's why we're having so many losses of lives with, which have gone above a million already in the planet and still growing in, tremendously. And this is what happens to the lungs. You see those are normal lungs and you see those white spots where the lung is hitting uh, the virus is hitting the lungs and it takes up almost most of the lung and you're only left with small lungs, baby lungs, called baby lungs. And you see this ent entering of the virus within your organisms and, and attacking your lungs produces a entrance to some receptors in the cells of the lungs and these uh, viruses inside reproduce and so alter the oxygen transport inside to your tissues, to your bloodstream and your tissues, but they also break these pneumocytes and they come out and reproduce, okay? So, but these, these RNAs are also affecting the DNA of cells. And so they are changing, not only destroying this tissue, but it happens that they also do, aside from this pneumolysis and lung cell destruction that is very severe, they can produce this coronavirus attack on, on humans. They can produce death and what we have called, and, and it's part of nature, natural cleansing. It's very sad, some people die, but it's, and there, if they are young people and have not reproduced, that's the end of the genetic line. But those that survive, some are left with, with uh, lesions in their lungs and are short of breath and so on, but those are probably suffering some genetic changes and they are becoming stronger organisms. And probably with this coronavirus, we are having a new species coming up, new humans. COVID and high altitude, the hypoxia challenge. This is very interesting. Look at this. This is the sea level values of oxygen. This is the city of La Paz where I live at 3,510 meters. You see, it's a city where people are living normally. 
When, when you come up to high altitude, your oxygen levels going from 98 go down to 60 as soon as you arrive. If you come up very fast, you can get some diseases like acute mountain sickness and so on. But if you come up slowly, you adapt. This is physiological adaptation. And your red blood cells increase from 42 here to 50%. That's the remarkable adaptation to chronic hypoxia. So in these cities like La Paz and El Alto, we are defeating hypoxia. We're defeating this, you see cells need oxygen. We, this is life, life is a fundamental component is oxygen, but we are defeating hypoxia at high altitude. And, and the, for us, this is normoxia. And that's why my father, said that we can not only adapt to the city of La Paz, we can adapt to higher mountains, even to the summit of Mount Everest. He proposed that man can adapt because he said, the organic system of human beings and all other species tend towards adaptation to any environmental change within an optimal period of time and never tend towards regression. Loss of adaptation or de-adaptation, that's, that's regression, that inevitably leads to death. So you see, we even live longer at high altitude. This is the lowland cities in Bolivia, and these are the highlands. It's an increasing order. Look how many more older than 100 years we have more at high altitude than in the lowlands. Same for older than uh, 90 years old. Look how much more people at high altitude live longer. So we have extended longevity at high altitude. We published this at BLDE Journal in uh, India, by the way. And this is the condor, Andean condor, whose eyes can look into the coronavirus with a very important vision, changing the aspects of hypoxia. And you see, this is one of our adaptation chambers where we're studying some patients here, adaptation at high altitude. This is our chronic hypoxia. And this is our pyramid laboratory at 5,250 meters where we're studying exercise. Now that comes because we are living here in a beautiful blue planet and we intend where we have plenty of oxygen, yet we intend to go to space. We want to go to Mars and there is no oxygen there. So we have to adapt to live with less oxygen. We have to adapt to live with less oxygen. This is extremely important. That's why I have proposed, you see, this is sea level pressures, and this is Mount Everest at 8,842 meters. And this is a man in space, in a space suit at 3,030 kilometers in space. But the important thing is that inside the, the uh, space suit, the pressure is 250 millimeters. You see, that's one third of the pressure of sea level. So in space, when spaceships are traveling, they have to lower the pressure from the space capsule to, to about the Everest uh, pressure in order to sustain life up there in a space suit. But we propose that space uh, ships use the pressure of the city of La Paz and astronauts adapt to hypoxia because this would allow them traveling in much more favorable conditions. And these pressures could drop, the suits could be lighter because there is, instead of having a 510 millimeters of difference going from the spaceship at sea level pressures, they would go from only the city of La Paz and chronic hypoxia would go into space. And that's what we call having biology take over part of the pressure differences and be extremely beneficial in changing the physics in space. That's why the starting pressure should be at the level of the city of La Paz. That's what we have proposed. And I have created a word related to this and related to this conference. And that's why I'm honored to be in your conference. I created the word biospace forming because in, in space, you have to adapt to life to that all it's the adaptation of all living beings on earth to space and we are doing we're going from earth to space so when i wrote when i first uh, published this uh, biospace forming work i i suddenly realized i should check on the web because i hadn't before i published it at blde journal in university where i'm a visiting professor by the way 
And on December the 31st in 2018, I checked on the, on the Google and it was the only time, only word that was on the Google. So I had fortunately created a new word because in, Moon, in Mars, you, they are planning to terraform it, terraform. That means changing Mars, but they have forgotten. And of course, Elon Musk Starship, which is absolutely amazing, they are going to carry out, to set up the life, human life in Mars. But you see, evolution has to go through biospace forming in space. How could, you? what happens is you see this spacesuit and you see this astronaut in space floating. You see all these limbs are there, but do these two limbs are absolutely useless in space. So I think we are going to have to become like this in space where there's no gravity. The legs will be gone. That will be evolution in space. Now that would probably take millions of years because you see to travel in space, we probably have to live in spaceships. And so humans will no longer need legs. I know this is shocking, but it's a fact because they are useless. They just consume oxygen and they will suffer atrophies. So long-term travel will not require legs. But you know, this would take genetically millions of years to happen. But through intelligence and the genetic manipulation that humans are doing, this is called intelligence. And intelligence is influencing genetics remarkably. So when we look again at Darwin's message, it is not the strongest of the species that survived, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. I have to disagree with him. The most intelligent are now going through space. Of course, he was living in a different time. You are manipulating genes, you're changing, you are giving quantum leaps in genetics. So I must end my talk rendering my my admiration for my father, who was called the mountain guru in, in Saint, he was named the mountain guru in Bangalore, India in November, 2009, because of his work in high altitude, he created our institution. And this as the three generations, this is him uh, and my daughter, along with my daughter, Natalia Subieta, who is the third generation, we continue to work with high altitude uh, problems and diseases and so on and so above all, adaptation to hypoxia. So that's the formula. And you see these are llamas in front of the highest mountain in La Paz, Bolivia. The base is at 4,300 meters, but the top is at 6,500 meters. And let me show you what we did up there. My father directed this soccer game, football game at 6,542 meters of altitude. That's how we have adapted to hypoxia remarkably. They, pay, they play this game at such immense altitude. And this game was uh, 20 minutes per side. You see the balls are painted uh, orange and red so they, they, don't, uh, they can be seen. And of course they played intensely 20 minutes per side. Everybody survived, which we were told, oh, don't do that, somebody could die. No, we are perfectly adapted to hypoxia. And hypoxia is a very, adaptation to hypoxia is a crucial factor of survival of the living beings because in space there will be little oxygen. So that's how, what I wanted to show you and invite you all to join us at the world capital of hypoxia in La Paz, Bolivia from October 10 to 12, 2021 where we will have our eighth chronic hypoxia symposium and we are looking towards the future with beautiful eyes. And we thank you geneticists for looking into our genes and changing our life, not only on planet earth, but beyond. If it weren't for the intelligence, I don't know if randomly life on earth would be taken to other planets, but through intelligence and through genetics, it is going to space. I want to thank my collaborators, my daughter, Natalia Subieta, my wife, Lucrecia de Urios, de Limarino, my other daughter, Rafaela Subieta, a collaborator, uh, my good friend from Italy, Professor Giuseppe Miserocci and Lucia Gisbert, 
Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. That was <laughs> that was really something to think about because connecting biology to Mars and connecting the altitude to such aspects, it's <laughs> something I would never even dream about if it truly came down to me. And it's just truly really amazing that you've thought of all of this. And it's just heartwarming to see you love your family so much. It's just everything about this presentation is just tr truly so heart touching. Well, um, I'm happy, Ritika, that you liked it. I wanted to present something original, different, and from a different focus. You see, if you look at me, I am a perfectly normally adapted guy living at this altitude. And if you see our city, you come to our city, Ritika. Come, you and the people that have organized your conference should maybe organize Darwin sometime in the future here in Bolivia from a different aspect of hypoxia. We, I'm, I'm sure we would love that. I'm sure we all would love that. Uh, so I think we will open the question and answer session for the audience. So sure. uh, audience, if you have any questions, we'd love to hear you. Yeah, uh, he's right. Uh, Mohan Gupta says it was totally new and something, yeah, and something different. different. Maybe there are no questions. <laughs> it's too far ahead in time. <laughs> And you know, all of them just keep writing the whole session was gasping. Such a great work you're doing. Bravo to you, sir. We are <laughs> well, all speechless. You see, you see, for instance, that concept that we don't need the legs in space. That's that's true. Because you see, we will have to travel, Ritka, Ritika, for a long time. So will we go to different planets? We're dreaming of going to different planets, but somehow. We will be living, we will create artificial planets in space and floating, we will be floating in space. That's, that's the only possibility, unless we travel, of course, much farther. At this, even traveling at the speed of light, the immensity of the, of the universe is so huge, it's so unimaginable that things, genetic changes for life to evolve have to be taken in that sense. You, you make it imaginable for us. You truly simplify it for us to dream about it, to actually make it real someday. Uh, although I did see one question in the chat box, Kaveri Dube asks, what will be the negative effect on the people surviving after suffering from COVID-19? Oh, uh, that's important. Uh, uh, that's important because the, some people that have lung disease are left with what's called fibrosis. So they, their oxygen levels will be lower than the normal people because part of the lung was lost due to inflammation and a complex mechanisms. But you see, you see that they adapt also, they will adapt and they will adapt with more red blood cells. And that's what happens with us at high altitude. We it is as though we had suffered COVID many thousands of years ago. We have adapted to lower oxygen. So don't worry, your lungs may be a little affected or some more affected than some people, but you will adapt through an increase of red blood cells. This is what we have been talking about. So don't, you know, but not only that, the, as I have proposed that the RNA, the viral RNA is changing the DNA most probably and so we are evolving to become a better, better species. Uh, so uh, I would look favorably to time. Uh, life is resilient. I wrote it in my abstract. Resilience is, is fabulous. Life is absolutely a power. You see, in, in, in physics, we talk about entropy, the disorder. Universe tends towards disorder. But life is exactly the opposite. It goes for order. It reorganizes it. It moves our genetics. It changes our genes. So we continue to be organized and survive. And maybe we are the only ones, although there are exoplanets in the world, I mean, in the universe, they are finding many exoplanets. 
but the characteristics of this planet are unique. So we have to look after life. We have to respect. And that's one of the beautiful things that India has done. India has looked after the, the nature. They respect nature more than most planets on earth. They respect plants, they respect animals, they love animals because it, uh, it took millions of years to build an elephant, my God. You know, genetics is, is uh, working this in this century and, and genetics has, I mean, artificial genetics, but biological, physiological life genetics has evolved in millions of years. However, I, I look at life with positivism always. This positivity is something I'm sure all of us are inspired by. I'm very sure of it. This kind of optimism is what keeps sessions like these alive. Yes. All right. So uh, then we have Claire. Um, what causes the momentary change in red blood cell count when moving from high altitude to low altitude? Oh, that's very interesting. You see, that's why I talked about genetic adaptation and physiological adaptation. I don't like to use the word acclimatization. It has been used by some biologists to defer it from genetic changes. It's referred to as genetic adaptation, but we like to call it genetic adaptation and biological adaptation. You see, I wrote an article a long time ago and it has to do with the most energy efficient mechanism. The, the, in other words, the organism is always looking for not, not carrying in your body something useless because it's always trying to look for the optimal way of working in your organism. And so when we, when we have more red, my hematocrit is 50% here at high altitude. When I go down to India and I remain there, 20 days, in 20 days, I lose linearly all my red blood cells, extra red blood cells. So my hematocrit can go down to 36, 38%. Why? Because I don't need to carry so many red blood cells to carry oxygen. There's plenty of oxygen. So I get rid of the red blood cells. And what is and the question is very good. What's the mechanism? The mechanism is twofold. One is because your red blood cells no longer are no longer the extra red blood cells to carry oxygen are no longer needed. So they stop producing your, your bone marrow stops producing red blood cells. There's a stop the industry of red blood cells because these only last 120 days. Normally uh, the red blood cells live only 120 days. So they stop producing red cells. That's why it's a linear decrease going down to in 20 days. And the other factor is called neocytolysis. And that is a very important factor. This was discovered, by the way, by uh, some uh, good friend of ours. And I mean, it was first written, uh, neocytolysis uh, by American friends it, because of space travel. You see, when we go to space, the space astronauts have anemia after they remain in space. And why is that? Because they, in space, you have less use of muscles. You know, we're standing up right now facing gravity. We are all using our muscles, consuming oxygen to stand up against gravity. But in space, you don't need to stand up. Your muscles start going away because you don't need them. And so you consume less oxygen. And since you, you have more oxygen than you need, then your red blood cells start decreasing. That's why it's called neocytolysis. Actually, cells are actually destroyed. You know, they can be destroyed because they are eliminated. So this is extremely important. That's why in space, I have proposed that spaceships should be like, in the, like you be using the pressure of the city of La Paz, because in space, you will be like in La Paz with more red blood cells because hypoxia stimulates your red blood cells. And that's what's necessary for re-entry to earth in this case. All right, uh, sir, that was our last question for the day. Thank you Very so good. much for coming in. Thank you so much for bringing in the new perspectives. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Ritika. I want to thank you, the organ, thank the organizers. I want to thank also the people that took me to India, Professor Tupil Venkatesh. I want to thank Professor Kusal Das from BLDE University, where I'm a visiting professor, uh, Praveen Sharma, and so many fantastic people. I love India. I look, I've been five times through India, invited to give talks all over India. I'll put my website and you, some of you can look at some of that. And by the way, if you're interested, I would like to record hypoxia in high altitude residents with the machines that uh, Dr. Professor Church has created to record hypoxia. We need to look at that at high altitude. Thank you very much, Vitka. Bye-bye. Bye, sir.